Well, in the first hour, we had a conversation, interesting conversation, about urban renewal, luxury housing, the homeless, the dollar store next to the empire of Journal Squared 1 and 2. And this idea of intimacy and living together and apart in a community is one that holds a fascination for me as someone who came from a relatively small town in the Midwest and then moved on up to the big city, New York City. And that leads us into this next conversation, which is another difficult topic. Over the weekend, there was another killing of a Columbia student, 30 years old, stabbed at 123rd Street in Amsterdam. Now, Columbia University is has in Morningside Heights is the neighborhood. On one side, there's Amsterdam, which is kind of the bad street. The other side is Broadway, which is the good street. And then Columbia is kind of in that block in the middle of those two streets and avenues. Davide Giri, a six-year doctoral student in the School of Engineering and Applied Science, died following a stabbing that occurred near 123rd Street in Amsterdam Avenue on Thursday around 11 p.m. Now, what's alarming about this is he is a six-year doctoral student He's at 123rd in Amsterdam at 11 o'clock at night. Now, some people say, hey, there you go. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He should know better. And during the investigation into Giri's murder, police discovered a second victim, a 27-year-old man with stab wounds near West 110th Street and Cathedral Parkway. He was taken to the hospital in stable condition. And the police found the suspect within the area of West 104th Street in Central Park West, threatening a third individual in Central Park with a knife. The suspect was later identified as Vincent Pinkney, a 25-year-old Harlem resident. Pinkney was accused and charged with murder, attempted murder, assault, attempted assault, and three counts of criminal possession of a weapon. Now this murder reflects an earlier murder. The murder of Tessa Majors. 18 years old, student at Barnard, which is sister college to Columbia University. This happened two years ago, 2019. Tessa Majors, a Barnard first year, died following a stabbing at West 116th Street in Morningside Drive in Morningside Park Wednesday night. And if you don't remember, here is the terrible reminiscence of what happened to her. According to police, a group of suspects approached Majors and demanded her property before stabbing her several times. Officers responded to a 911 call from a security guard at 5.36 p.m. and arrived to find Majors unconscious with multiple stab wounds. Despite conflicting reports, Columbia clarified that the public safety officer stationed at 116th Street and Morningside Drive was at his post when the incident occurred and came to Major's aid upon recognizing that she was hurt. So within two years, you have two bloody, vicious stabbings in and around Columbia University in the city of New York. And these deaths have led to an interesting and compelling conversation.
and the conversation revolves around this idea of being safe and being woke and being politically correct and of towing the line of not appearing to be racially or culturally prejudiced everyone is treated equally and all of that is fine in the theory of the classroom but as those of us who live real lives know that theory doesn't always translate well into the real world and that is what we're dealing with now in these deaths of these two people There used to be a time when you were a student at Columbia University where the university itself, and if not the university, your instructors and your classmates would give you the lowdown. And the lowdown is not just limited to Columbia University. It's New York University, it's Lincoln, Nebraska, it's Sacramento, California, it's Kansas City, Missouri. It's anywhere you live in a big, culturally diverse city with pockets of poverty and other pockets of richness in conflict in the same community. And at Columbia, I was warned, as were my classmates, look, we know that you're all from different places. You're not all from New York City. You have to be street smart and you have to be aware of your surroundings. What does that mean? Well, don't go to Morningside Park after dark. It's a big, sprawling, beautiful park with lots of people in it. And the people who are there are not necessarily like you. They're to stroll and have a wonderful time. They're there looking for trouble. They're there looking for drug money. They are there selling drugs. Don't put yourself in the situation of being in that park after dark because nothing good happens after the sun goes down. That's just a common understanding that the police will tell you, that your parents will tell you, that your friends will tell you. Nothing good happens when the sun goes down. And a lot of that's because of identity and stealthiness and bad things can happen in the dark and sometimes people don't see them. Also, when I was a student at Columbia, there was this idea that be wary of going above 125th Street. 125th Street was the boundary between the safe neighborhood of Columbia and then the above neighborhood of Harlem where things changed, especially if you're a lily white boy from Nebraska, which I will explain in just a moment. I'll go more into depth on that. But that was the warning. Look, Columbia University is at 116th and Broadway and you go nine streets up the street and everything changes. The demarcation line is 125th Street. The beginning of Harlem. Don't go there at night. Columbia kids tend to be well connected, have a lot of money, they have nice clothing. And if you don't fit in, if you stand out at night or even at 530 in the park with Tessa Majors, people are going to watch you. They watch how you dress, they watch how you behave. They study behavior. It's in science, in animal science to them. Not that they're animals, but that you are an animal. An animal that is vulnerable and an animal who might not be able to escape. And the other side of the coin was beware of Amsterdam Avenue. There are lots of nice things on that avenue, but know where you're going. Go with somebody and don't go too high, which meant, which meant don't go much higher than 116th, 117th Street. Because the neighborhood begins to change and there are dangers. 
And when I was at Columbia, if you were a student, male or female, and it was at night, and you wanted to go to your dorm or walk to your apartment nearby, there was a special phone number you could call and you could get help. And someone would come over and walk you home. I think it was a couple of people. So there'd be three of you all together walking together and people really don't mess with you if you're with a group. But if you're young and cute and small and you look vulnerable and delicious, then you're more of a mark. So those were the warnings given to you. And even growing up in the Midwest, don't go into this area. That's a bad neighborhood. They don't want you there. Okay? Well, in the last five, ten years, we've had a change in America where talking about race and culture and economics and safety is much more touchy than it used to be. As we saw in that video, that we have... White power people marching on the malls. Restore America. What does that mean? Well, we know what it means. And so at Columbia, where they used to have these formal and informal warning sessions, don't go here, don't go there, look at what time it is, don't walk through that park. Now they don't do it. Because... You're being culturally insensitive. You are economically discriminating against the park and against those who live above 125th Street and on Amsterdam Avenue. So we, as Columbia University, a liberal megacenter of thought and deconstruction of norms, will not tell you anymore. Don't go there. If you're going to cross that street, Make a phone call, bring a couple of people with you. Because that looks bad. That doesn't look progressive. That doesn't look liberal enough. So if people don't have the information they need to stay safe, if people have never been told, don't go into that park after dark, if you're young and vulnerable, or you don't know how to take care of yourself, don't go there. And some people think that they, that they are invulnerable. That's the mark of the young mind. Nothing can kill me. I'm young. Until something terrible happens. That's why you need sources of authority to make these recommendations. Don't go there. You should not go there. And then your friends get that message and your friends say, don't go there. Go this way. Go that way. Go around that street and come here. Now there are some instructors at Columbia University who've been there for a long time. I won't name them. Who do? Especially with their freshman classes, say, right at the beginning, look, you're in New York. It's a different place from where you're probably from. Be careful. Be careful of this area. Don't go there alone. Don't go here alone. And you worry about this graduate student who'd been there for six years and no one had told him, hey, don't have soccer practice at 11 o'clock at night and walk home from 123rd Street and Amsterdam Avenue. You are asking for trouble. You are looking for pain. Because people look at you in the neighborhood. He doesn't fit in here. He's not from around here. He's not even aware that we're following him. Now, sure, you have crazy people on the train with knives yelling. But in the case of Tessa, these were young men who were very determined to get whatever she had. I believe they wanted her iPhone, and she gave it to them, and then they stabbed her anyway. So I think we need to be a little more aware and maybe a little less woke in some of these situations and be honest with people and say, you can't go here, you can't do that. Because it's not safe. Because you don't fit in. Oh, that's racist. Oh, that's not fair. Well, I can tell you, where we live in Jersey City, our, our building is very safe. But you start wandering out, Journal Square at night, in that fountain. The homeless are there. There's drug dealing up the street. And you got to be careful where you walk. 
You gotta be careful who, 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 with whom you associate with. And you walk with confidence, and you try to dress down, and you try to fit in the neighborhood. And that's important. Because I've been told you don't fit in our own place in Jersey City. In the Heights, our super said, be careful around here. You don't fit. And I said, what do you mean I don't fit? You don't fit. And not talking about skin color, talking about attitude, way you walk. And while we were lived in that apartment for 17 years, and right across the street, 30 feet away, there was a murder. Fourth of July. Somebody shot dead right there. They turned the gun from this way, shooting the person just this much, and shot, put a gun right through our living room window. But that's the risk you take. In a big city, in a small town, it doesn't matter. You have to know if you fit or not and what you're going to do about it. So this all horribleness reminded me of a story that I wrote several years ago that I'll share with you now. And the story is this, called Lucky in Harlem, published in 2006. And I'll tell you the story. You can go check it out on bowlsblogs.com. But I'll tell you the story briefly so you know what it is. Jan and I had moved to New York City. We had both come from the Midwest. I came from Lincoln, Nebraska. She came from Council Bluffs, Oklahoma. And we lived for about eight months in Washington, D.C. before we came to New York City. And we had rented a Penske van and we loaded all the few possessions we had and we drove up from D.C. And we arrived in D.C. and we were going down Riverside Drive the wrong way on a one-way street. And luckily, we did not get into an accident. But we were both very tired, very worn out, and it was dark. So we unloaded the truck in our new apartment that we were subletting for the summer. And we had returned the truck that night or we were going to be charged for another day. I think that was $180 a day for this truck. And we didn't have the money. So we went to the nearest, I think it was U-Haul Penske Place, 125th Street in Harlem. And this was 20 years ago. And so we drove up there, returned the truck on time, great. And we knew 125th Street from what we had been kind of told was the beginning of where people like you don't really fit. Be careful, because it's starting to gentrify, and people are upset that their brownstones in Harlem are being purchased by white yuppies, is what they were called at that time. So just be aware of your surroundings. Okay, we're tough. So Jana was wearing shorts. It was very hot. It was, I believe, August. And I was wearing a Washington Redskins t-shirt neon yellow shorts, a Nebraska trucker hat, and Converse tennis shoes. I could not have dressed more horribly to not fit in than I was dressed that night. So we returned the truck and said, hey, we've got to get it back to Columbia University where we're subletting a dorm. Where is it? The guy said, it's just up the street. Go that way. You can walk. I said, oh, we're going to have to take the subway? a taxi and the guy laughs and no nah, just walk it's down to 116th street okay so we left and we're walking on 125th street we had to go this way and then turn and go down and somehow we got turned around and we were walking this way and it's very dark and the street life is active. And there's Jana, a very sweet young woman from the Midwest in her beautiful shorts and me in my neon yellow shorts and my Washington Redskins top. Walking together on 125th Street in the wrong direction. And we're walking and walking and walking and walking. And I'm looking around and Jana's looking around and I say, I gotta be calm because people are watching us. I gotta look like I fit in. 
And she said, where is Columbia? I said, it's right up here. Just It's not that far. We didn't have a map or anything. We didn't have anything. I don't even think we had our wallets with us, our money with us. We had nothing. We thought we were returning and going back. So we're walking for like half an hour, walking, looking around, trying to get a landmark. And she said, why don't you just, Janice said, why don't you just go into one of these stores and ask for help? Just find out where Columbia University is. I said, I can't go to this store like this. They're going to laugh at me. Oh, you're Columbia University, huh? Oh. So I said, look, it's just up here. We just keep walking. It'll be fine. So we're walking and walking and walking. And Jana said, I think we're lost. And it's the classic stereotypical male jerk. Lost. I don't need a map. I have an inherent sense of where we are. I drove up here from Columbia University. We went to the Penske. Bay. I know where we are. We're almost there. Keep walking, walking. And another couple of blocks, Jan said, I'm going to go in there and ask for help. I said, I, we, 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 we can't. And so we, we, we just kind of both were scared and not knowing, but we just get, if we keep walking, we're going to find something that we recognize and we're going to be safe. So we're walking on 125th Street, and finally we end up at this intersection. And it looks like a highway to us or an interstate from where we came from. And there's a big bridge and cars are going back and forth. And you can't even cross the street. So the street that we're on, we're, we can't even, we can't, the only thing we can do is turn around and go back and walk for another 45 minutes in the opposite direction, which would have eventually taken us back where we needed to go. But we didn't know that. So the two of us are standing there on the, on the street corner. And she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her, and I don't know what to do. And she wants to go ask someone for directions. And I'm in my Washington Redskins shirt and my neon yellow shorts, and she's in her shorts with flip-flops. And we must have looked like a prime target. Very vulnerable. And then out of nowhere... This guy approached us, and he was black and very big. And he had a very nice smile on his face. And he came up to us like he knew us, right? Because people are watching. And he shook our hands, said, hey, how you doing? And we're from the Midwest, so we shake hands. And then very quietly, he said, are you guys lost? And it was Jana who had the bravery to say, yes, we're lost. And I just kind of nodded my head. So this guy said, okay, I'll help you hang on. And he went into the street and he flagged down a taxi. Taxi pulls over. And he opened the door for us. He said, get in. And the guy took $20 out of his wallet and gave it to the taxi driver. And he said, take them to Columbia University because we had told him that's what we're trying to find he said you are <laughs> you're going in the wrong direction it's 45 minutes that way walking you're nowhere near Columbia University he said look where you are this is not a safe place for you so that's when he got us the taxi put us in there gave the taxi driver $20 said take them to Columbia University and the taxi driver looked back and looked at us and nodded his head and said okay and instantly we were gone. I couldn't even talk. I didn't even thank the guy. I was just numb. 45 minutes in the wrong direction. That's embarrassing. That hurts my stupid male ego. And I don't know what his name was. I don't know who he was. 
What? That night we were saved from ourselves. I was saved from myself. Janet was not in trouble. She knew what to do. I didn't know what to do. And the cab driver drove us a long time <laughs> and took us to Columbia University and we knew where we were. We got out of the cab and we, we said, you know, I would don't have, he said, don't worry about money. Go, just go. And we returned safely home to our sublet apartment. And I often think about that night and I think, what if that nice guy had to come up and ask us if we were lost? And I hope that we would have been fine. We would have finally found our way home, but I don't think we could have walked it. We were pretty tired. It had been a very long day driving up from DC, unpacking, taking back the stupid U-Haul, and walking for 45 minutes in the wrong direction. So that's a story that always gets me because it was such a kind gesture that you can really never repay. You can try to pay it forward to help someone else, and we have always tried to do our best to help other people. So here's the full story of what I just told you. Written probably maybe a little bit less emotionally. But it still has meaning. And that was written in 2006. And here's an article I wrote in 1997, which is about six years after I graduated from Columbia University. I wrote this as sort of a guide for people coming to New York City on how to fit in. Because we had people coming from the Midwest who would come. And we learned a lot of lessons that we started that first night, lucky in Harlem. Or we were saved by an anonymous person who stepped forward and got us home. And this tells you how to survive. Where you live, we live in Alphabet City. Alphabet City is bound by here and here and here and here. What to wear in New York City. One of the first things we learned when we moved to New York was how to dress. Don't wear a Washington Redskins shirt and neon yellow shorts if you want to fit in. The idea is not to dress like a tourist. And for us, that means no Midwestern clothes. Don't wear a dress or a skirt if you're a woman. If you're a man, wear jeans, not dress pants. Now, these are say, these are probably not progressive ideas. And I'm sure I'd be told, that's culturally insensitive. A woman can wear a dress if she wants to. Sure, she can. She can wear a dress if she wants to. But if she wants to fit in and not be noticed, there are certain things you have to do in the big city. In New York City, you fit in by wearing dark clothes. Oh, no, I wear pink shirts. Okay, go ahead. There's a jacket that I used to wear. It was an expensive jacket, but it fit in because it wasn't tan. It was dark black. Do not wear white sneakers. Sounds ridiculous, right? People like plaque in New York. You want to fit in. You want to look like you belong when you're a tourist. Don't look like a tourist. Wearing sunglasses is good because... If you're nervous about it, if people are looking at you, if they're watching you, you can hide behind your sunglasses. How to behave? There's always someone out there who wants to be uglier than they already are. Keep your money in your sock. Use two wallets. One with money, one with just a couple of dollars in it. So if someone says, give me your wallet, you give them the fake wallet. Are you being followed? Turn around and look the person in the eye. Let them know you see them. That's very effective. And people sometimes do follow you or they try to make eye contact with you. So you can make eye contact back without being aggressive. You can just look at them so they know you're looking at them. Scared people, people who are afraid of getting mugged, try to pretend they're not there. They try to disappear into themselves. Oh, I won't look at you. Oh, you won't look at me? Well, I'm going to look at you. Yell fire if you're in trouble. Don't say help, I need help. People won't assist you. If you yell the building's on fire, then 
people are self-interested. Oh no, your building's on fire, maybe my building's on fire. They respond to yelling fire. They don't respond to call the police. Make eye contact with a stranger if you're in trouble. People don't want to step forward and help all the time. New York is very good about helping. But if you really need help, you've got to make eye contact with somebody on the street that you don't know and say, I need help. And they will help you. Trust your gut. Prepare for the worst. Keep an eye out for hospitals, firehouses, cops on foot patrol. If someone stabs me or shoots me, I need to know where I need to go to get myself help in a hurry. And those are my tips for visiting New York City. You can read it right now on bowlsblogs.com. A shooting in New York. Survival tips for the wary. And with that, my friend, we're going to take a brief break 